We're rapidly working through all the AMD Zen 3 CPUs that launched today, reviewing all four of them in about a 24-hour period. So we started with the AMD R9 5950X, which is the $800 16-core CPU. We dropped down to the 12-core 5900X. Both of those reviews are already on the channel, so you should check the channel to get that data. And now we're looking at the R5 5600X, which is more of a potentially gaming-targeted CPU. So we're going to have a heavier gaming focus on this one with, of course, the usual workstation overclocking and power tests. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Corsair 4000D Airflow case. We recently reviewed the Corsair 4000D Airflow as a return to high-performance cases by Corsair, but also talked about its attention to detail on color matching the individual components of the case. The 4000D Airflow is marketed as an affordable, performance-focused chassis with ease of installation features like refined cable management routing and pathways. Learn more about the Corsair 4000D Airflow at the link in the description below. So this is the one where it really starts to get interesting because Intel and its 10600K put out one of the best possible gaming parts you could buy right now. And the reason it was good and the reason we've, for the last few months before now anyway, said that it made the most sense to purchase was because you could easily overclock it, really not that difficult, especially if you did a cache OC and get it up to 10900K levels and basically pass or equal to 10900K levels if all other things are mostly equal in games. And that's because the extra cores, once you're talking 5 gigahertz, 5.1 gigahertz, cache tune, maybe memory tune, all those things together, there's not really a whole lot that the extra cores would do in most games. And so the 10600K became this really good value gaming CPU at about the $300 mark. Now though, the 5600X looks to challenge that. And previously, the 10600K versus a 3600 when the 3600 was 200 dollars anyway before it dropped to 150. the the real argument for the 3600 was basically well you're trying to save 100 bucks and that's kind of the main reason you'd buy it it's a little bit advantaged in some workstation applications versus the lower end cpus from intel and uh, otherwise you may buy a 3300x for low end cheap gaming the 5600X lands in the middle. It is a uh, $300 part. It's supposed to be replacing the 3600X, except no one really feels that way because no one bought the 3600X. And if you did, sorry. But most people bought a 3600. 3600X made more sense when they tanked the price to be $10 more than the 3600. There's a reason they did that. It's because they couldn't sell any of them. So when everybody, including us, for the last three years now told AMD, uh, or told buyers of AMD, don't buy the XQ CPUs, buy the non-X one, spend literally five minutes in BIOS and you can get it to the XQ performance for $50 cheaper. AMD's response to nobody's buying the X CPUs was to make literally only X CPUs and then kill everything else. So there will probably, almost certainly be a $200 part. That's basically guaranteed. We don't know when, but it will happen with Zen 3. When that comes out, we'll review it. We know there's a lot of interest from people who are looking for a 3600 equivalent at the $200 range, but that's not what we got today. We got a 10600K competitor instead. Let's start with the gaming benchmarks and then we'll walk through the rest. And of course, you can check the channel for the 5950X and 5900X. 58's coming up shortly. The 5800X we're saving for last because we need to paint the picture of what it looks like on either flank of the 5800X because there's it doesn't look as good as these other ones. That's that's kind of the dud in this launch, but we'll talk about that later. Let's get into the gaming benchmarks. We'll start with validating the frequency. This is important to understand the performance of the processor that we'll be looking at later. This chart looks at all core load and frequency decay over time. We've removed the 5950X and have zoomed the chart in to make it more legible. The R9 5900X decayed over the 600 second period and rested around 4350 MHz, with its maximum single core per interval at 4400 to 4500 MHz. The R5 5600X ran higher clocks than this at about 4400 MHz and boosting upwards of 4600 MHz throughout the test. As such, in heavily multi-threaded games, but where cores have a limited value, it'll outperform the 5900X. Just quickly, here's the single core boosting behavior in Cinebench 1T. The 5950X did about 5050 MHz with the 5900X, at about 4950 megahertz. The 5600X ran about 4650 megahertz single core. So far, its load frequency is higher, which helps in most games, while its single core frequency is lower than its neighboring parts. We'll start with the game benchmarks for the 5600X since it's more of a gaming targeted CPU as opposed to the 59 and 5950X, where we started with production benchmarks. Civilization 6 will start us off. We use the AI benchmark for turn time calculations measured in seconds for this test. The turn times, because they're measured in seconds, end up being a real-world metric with a tangible impact that most people can understand pretty well. 
We process five AI player turns against four test passes, resulting in about 20 turns processed and averaged. The standard deviation is about 0.1 seconds, and the more AI players there are, the longer it'll take for your next turn, especially so with a slower CPU. The R5-5600X falls in line behind the other AMD CPUs at the top of the chart, but not before allowing the 10900K at 5.2 GHz to slip in just ahead. The 5600X stock CPU required 29.8 seconds to process each turn when stock, or 28.3 seconds, a reduction of 5%, when overclocked to 4.8 GHz all core. The 5900X stock CPU leads the 5600X by about 10% time reduced, which is probably not worth the increased cost for most people who are doing gaming only PC builds. The 10600K is the closest AMD R5-5600X competitor from Intel and is priced appropriately to compete, and it required 31.8 seconds per turn when overclocked to 5 GHz for all core or 33.6 seconds when running stock. That has the R5-5600X 11% ahead of the 10600K stock and 17.5% ahead of the R5-3600 stock CPU from last generation. Red Dead Redemption 2 is next. This is one of the few holdouts left for Intel. Might actually might be the only one that we have in our charts right now. It maintains an approximate lead of 4 to 5% here, depending on which CPUs you're comparing. The 5600X did 154 FPS average in this one, with lows disproportionately behind where Intel's lows plot. That'd be 78 FPS and 70 FPS, 1% and 0.1% for the 5600X. They're not stuttery or perceivably bad or experience ruining, just objectively worse than what Intel's running. The Intel i5-10600K stock CPU ran this benchmark at 160 FPS average, with the overclock doing nothing. We'd need it to be at least 5.1 GHz to improve, and even that, you're talking maybe 1%. The 10600K stock results has lows of 112 and 104 FPS, and overall leads the 10600K by 4.2%. Intel has kept its lead, but only just barely. The 5600X at 4.8 GHz all core manages to pull ahead at 162 FPS average, although its lows are still below Intel's. Generationally, AMD has gained 19% over the AMD R5-3600 CPU with its new 5600X. That's not exactly a like-for-like -like comparison given the price difference, but just in terms of where they're positioning the CPUs, that's about the difference. Running Red Dead Redemption 2 at high settings instead imposes more of a GPU bind in some scenarios. The R5-5600X pushed 143 FPS average, with lows at 74 FPS and 66 FPS for 1% and 0.1%. The R5-5600X OC to 4.8 GHz all core improved by just 1% and wasn't worth it. Compared to last generation's R5-3600's 123 FPS average, the 5600X improved by 16%. As for Intel's i5-10600K, it maintains the lead that it had. Intel is technically in the lead at 145 FPS average, but that's just 1.5%. The lead in frame time consistency is more notable at 96 and 85 FPS, 1% and 0.1%, but the 5600X isn't exactly stuttering or anything, it's just not as good. Total War Three Kingdoms and the Battle Benchmark is next. We'll also look at the Campaign Benchmark for this one. The Battle Benchmark at 1080p has the AMD R5-5600X stock CPU at an impressive 201 FPS average, which actually ranks it ahead of the 10900K at 5.2 GHz. In looking into this, because we're starting to hit GPU binds at the top of this chart, evidenced by all the AMD parts hitting the same point, our current theory is that AMD has a slightly higher point of GPU limitations than Intel. This was reversed last generation. Previously, AMD would top out at a lower GPU bottleneck point than Intel would, which just comes down to how the GPU interacts with the CPU. In this case, we wonder if the combination of PCIe Gen 4, which is only worth about 1-2% to over Gen 3 in most games, but that is still an increased ceiling, and the higher IPC might be the advantage that's boosting AMD's ceiling a little bit higher than Intel's. Either way, the 5600X stock CPU outdid the 10600K stock CPU by 11%, and outdid the R5-3600 and 3700X by about 28%. The campaign benchmark is next. This one features overview movement on the Grand Campaign Strategy map. The AMD R5-5600X at 4.8 GHz all core seems to be the right combination of cores and frequency for this test especially with that extra 100 megahertz across all cores with OC. It's at 144 FPS average, which is ahead of the 4.7 gigahertz all core OCs seen on some of the other CPUs. The 5600X stock CPU did 135 FPS average, so the overclock gained 6.4% over stock. Again, this is the right combination of limited thread peak boosting that we showed earlier, 
combined with the game's reduced focus on high core count. The Intel i9-10900K at 5.2GHz seems to be Intel ceiling here, although there's plenty more GPU headroom for performance, and the 10600K caps at about 112 FPS average or 117 FPS average overclocked. The 5600X ends up leading the 10600K by about 20% here, which is a huge jump considering the i5-10600K was a CPU we could easily recommend as the best all-around gaming CPU period previously. As for the 3600, that's at 104 FPS average, led by the 5600 by 30%. The Division 2 is next, tested at 1080p medium. As with all other games tested, we recently updated this data with a fresh set of tests on the EVGA RTX 3080 FTW3, which has raised the ceiling for GPU limitations and allowed more visibility into CPU scaling. The AMD R5 5600X stock CPU did 244 FPS average, landing between the 5900X and 5950X CPUs. It's outperforming the 5900X stock CPU as a result of the higher boosting frequencies that we showed you earlier. You can check the Blender and the Cinebench frequency plots to understand just why the 5600X does better in some of these games. Basically, the 3900X isn't hitting its peak boosts because of all of the cores are loaded at some level by the game, even if it's inefficient to do so. More focused load on a few key cores would potentially permit higher boosting and remedy some of this, but for now, the 5600X is paving the way as the most sensible balance of a gaming CPU out of what's on the chart currently. Overclocking gets it to 250 FPS average, right at the top of the charts, but the 5900X at a fixed frequency is within run-to-run -run variance and error. The 10600K stock CPU held 194 FPS average, allowing the 5600X stock CPU a lead of 26%. The 5600X stock CPU leads the R5 3600 and its 175 FPS average by 40%. Tomb Raider is next. In this one, the AMD R5 5600X stock CPU ran 196 FPS average, which puts it tied with the 10900K stock CPU. The R5 5600X OC improved performance only to 200 FPS average, or about 2%, so it's not worth it here. The 5600X is outmatched by AMD's own higher core count CPUs in this game, and based on the 5950X's positioning, it seems that there are some diminishing gains, even at 16 cores, 32 threads. The 10600K stock CPU held 165 FPS average, allowing the 5600X a lead of 18.5%. As for the R5 3600, that's at 137 FPS average. You can see the gap between the 3600 and 2700X was much smaller than the gap between the 3600 and the 5600X. Some of that, of course, is the difference of being a 2700X versus a 2600, but most of it is the architectural change. It ends up being 43% for the new generation. The 3700X, despite rough price equivalents and more cores than the 5600X, is not able to leverage them more effectively than the 5600X is able to leverage its IPC improvements. F1 2020 is up now, a game that has historically been heavily frequency dependent. We're not hitting the GPU limits in this one, so it's good for showing full scaling of the CPUs. The AMD R5 5600X stock CPU did 323 FPS average, which puts it about tied with the Intel i9-10900K, even in lows. The 5600X OC got it to 330 FPS average, but the 5900X stock CPU drew a line in the sand and maintained a 7% advantage over the 5600X stock CPU. The Intel i5-10600K at 267 FPS average loses the battle here, but you can see where the Intel CPUs previously had their own division drawn between the AMD Ryzen 3000 parts and the i5-10600. Now it's all neatly packed together. Intel is almost segmented completely in the center, AMD gets the bottom of the stack for its older CPUs, and AMD gets the top of the stack for its newer CPUs. The 3600, just as point of reference, is outdone by 45% here against the stock 5600X CPU. Assassin's Creed is next. For this test, the AMD R5 5600X CPU managed 142 FPS average, which puts it just ahead of the 10600K at 5 GHz all core, or 7.6% ahead of the stock 10600K at 132 FPS average. That also means it's about 7-8% to 8 ahead of the 3700X 8 core 16 thread CPU at the same price. Compared to the R5 3600, there's a meaningful and noticeable uplift of 16% stock to stock. The 5600X isn't the chart leader here, and does still get beaten, in only a technical sense, by the 3900X. As you're seeing, the stack shuffles a bit based on the game, with no consistent ranking. Overall, 
patterns are emerging here, namely Intel being in the middle of the new and old AMD CPUs, but the rank of the 5600X moves around a little bit from game to game. The last one is GTA 5. This game is from 2015 from 2013 and is always fun as a CPU test, mostly because of its storied history of weird performance behaviors that we've discovered and documented in previous videos. Even still, it's been a stronghold for Intel. The R5 5600X runs at 131 FPS average, just ahead of the i9-10900K, and outperforms the 10600K stock CPU's 114 FPS average by 15%. The lows are also proportionate against the average for each of these. The R5 5600X overclock gains 4.5% over the stock results, posting better gains than in some of the other game tests we've shown. Compared to the R5 3600 stock CPU, improvement in the 5600X is 28%. Time to get into production testing. The 5600X doesn't need to be as good as this stuff since gaming is more of its de facto audience, but we'll still go through some comparative numbers. Remember to keep an eye specifically on the 3700X as that's priced similarly and has two additional cores, which might benefit it more than the architectural changes. Photoshop is next. It's crazy how this is unfolding throughout the day. We wrote these reviews in the order we published them, and so in real time, just as you might be following along with our 5950X and then 5900X reviews, we now get to see how the Photoshop chart is slowly and completely being consumed by AMD parts. Intel is getting pushed further down the stack in a benchmark that was once its strongest point in production workloads. Here, the 5600X stock scores 1259 points in aggregate between filters, transforms, warps, blurs, and other tasks, which has it actually above the $500 10900K. The 5600X is led by the stock 5900X at 1330 points, but only by 5.6%. If you're doing a lot of Photoshop work, this might be the best part to buy with a stricter budget right now. Intel used to get that budget Photoshop user crown too, but no more. The 5600X OC at 4.8 GHz pushes it to 1306 points, which is better than what we saw in the 4.6 GHz all-core uh, in terms of the relative scaling, not absolute numbers, with the 5950X. So in that one, we saw performance degradation from a stock because the boosting frequency was more valuable on the 5950X than the all-core of just 4.6. But hitting 4.7 and above seems to actually solidify an improvement, and so that's what we're seeing here. The uplift OC to stock on the 5600X was 3.7%, which isn't particularly worth it if only using Photoshop, but it's not bad as a side bonus if you're focusing on other things first. Compression and decompression are next, useful for people who do a lot of file management. This is measured in millions of instructions per second, or MIPS, and the 5600X stock CPU scored 69,000 MIPS, improving by 4.3% when overclocked to 4.8 GHz all core. That puts the 5600X as flanking the $380 Intel i7-10700K and the stock 5600X as capable of 19% more operations per second than the i5-10600K when overclocked to 5 GHz. Compared to the stock 10600K, the 5600X's advantage is closer to 28%. The R9 5900X, for reference, boosts 67% over the stock 5600X, showing nonlinear but still significant gains over the cheaper of the two AMD parts. Finally, compared to the 3600 from last generation, the 5600X improved 25%. Again, that'd be similar if compared against the 3600X. In decompression, the 5600X stock completed 88,000 MIPS, or 93,000 MIPS when overclocked. That puts them sandwiched between the 10700K and the 3700X. If you want to do this type of work, you really should be considering a 3700X as a potentially cheaper alternative, assuming you can get one used, or that it does come down in price at some point. If they're not below the 5600X price, well, in this case, it's not particularly worth pursuing. Compared to the 10600K stock CPU, the 5600X outperforms it by about 42%, and so there is, in this instance, a huge rift in the production capabilities of the Intel and AMD price-for-price -price parts. Next up is Blender, using tile-based rendering to spawn one tile for each thread available on the CPU. The AMD R5 5600X completed the heavier GM logo workload in 23 minutes, plotting it as just ahead of the 10600K at 5 GHz, or 14% reduced in time required versus the 10600K stock CPU. The 5600X is outperformed by the 2700X in this one, illustrating perfectly why we do multiple renders for our Blender testing rather than just calling it a day after doing one. The next test, the GN logo, will flip the script on the 2700X's positioning. Compared to the R5 3600, though, for the 5600X, there is improvement of 9% stock to stock. 
The gains are reduced as workloads deviate from limited thread boosting scenarios like games, where the higher frequencies can really come into play. In the lighter weight GN Monkey Heads render, the R5 5600X completed the render in 19 minutes when stock, reduced 7% when overclocked. The overclock had to be adjusted down to 4.7 GHz all core here, as the CPU was unable to sustain 4.8 GHz without a heavier duty cooler, and we enforce a standardized cooler for reviews. The 10600K at 5 GHz takes a similar amount of time to the 5600X stock, with the stock uh, 10600K at 22 minutes. That means the 5600X requires 15% less time than the Intel i5-10600K to render, and so the 3700X is what's left to talk about. That one leads the 5600X and by 12%. So the higher IPC and frequency uplift of the new CPUs isn't outweighing the core count advantage of the 8-core in this benchmark. FFmpeg is up now. As a reminder yet again, we updated this off of Handbrake this time and instead to FFmpeg for transcoding video files for H.264 to H.265. Single file transcodes are still limited on core count despite some tuning and optimization, and so the 5950X, as seen in this single file transcode, doesn't scale as much as it does in our triple file simultaneous transcode, which loads the entire CPU. We'll look at that next. For this one, the AMD R5 5600X required 28.7 minutes to complete a single file transcode, which has it about equal to the 10700K, with Intel technically in the lead. And it's also just behind the AMD R7 3700X. As stated earlier, you really might want to try and explore cheaper options of the 3700X, assuming they exist. We're not sure what the stock's gonna look like, or more importantly, if the pricing will change, AMD tends to keep its previous generation alive for a little while with a new launch, and historically, its prices have come down each time. We'll see if that still happens, though, now that AMD is fully leading and that there's unprecedented demand for the entire industry. The Intel i5-10600K stock CPU, similar in price to the 5600X, requires 35 minutes to complete this transcode. That allows the 5600 a benefit of 19% here. Overclocking the 5600X reduces the time requirement by 7.7%, and the 5900X, meanwhile, completes this work in 18 minutes stock, marking it as 36% faster than the stock 5600X. Here's the multi-file benchmark. This one transcodes three files simultaneously, which allows the high core count CPUs, like the 5950X at 16 cores, to break rank and scale disproportionately better than the rest of the CPUs. The 5600X requires 81 minutes to complete this work, which is actually pretty close to a linear increase in time required from the original 28.7 minute time. The 5900X does pull away though at 47% faster rather than 36% previously. Here's a Chromium code compile benchmark. In this one, the AMD R9 5950X set the bar for this generation at 46 minutes stock, with the 3970X predictably ahead of that. This scales well with cores, but it also needs memory as your CPU capabilities increase into Threadripper territory. The AMD R5 5600X completed this code compile in 108 minutes stock, and 103 minutes when overclocked to 4.7 GHz all core. The 5600X is actually not that much better than the 2700X, considering that the multi-generational gap between them had several changes in architecture and even CCD and CCX fundamental changes with this generation. The advantage here calculates to only about 6.5% for the 5600X versus the 2700X. The 5900X stock does this in 57 minutes, with the 3700X at 90 minutes. The 3700X is significantly better than the 5600X at about 17% reduced time, and they're priced about the same, currently at least. This fact makes the 3700X once again a better deal for many of these workstation type applications, assuming you're able to find one a little bit cheaper. The cores in this scenario are not outweighed by the increased IPC. Power consumption testing is last. This is tested at the EPS 12 volt rails and represents CPU only draw before VRM efficiency losses, although we use high-end VRMs for all of our power testing setups, so they're minimal. The power consumption numbers for CPUs and GPUs in our reviews can mostly be linearly added to get an idea for your PSE requirements under an assumed 100% system load. There's no other noisy data in our power measurements, so you can just look at these as the CPU draw or the GPU in our GPU benches. The AMD R5 5600X CPU pulled 67 watts in an all-core workload in Blender, which has it just below the AMD R3 3300X CPU. The R7 3700X, since it's a primary comparison in workstation tests, was pulling about 85 watts in the same conditions. 
Overclocking the 5600X has two entries because our higher performing 4.8 gigahertz clock was not stable in every single application. This one required 1.4 volts get for V core, which pushed power up to 109 watts. The 5600X at 4.7 gigahertz and a tuned 1.319 volts get V core pulled 92 watts. Intel's 10600K stock CPU sits between these two results with the i5 10600K OC at 218 watts near the 3970X. We'll quickly highlight the 5900X and 5950X on the screen as well, including their overclocked numbers, just to get you up to speed on everything else released today. Cinematch power testing is useful primarily to root out any hidden performance characteristics when tested in a shorter time window. Our Blender numbers previously are taken after 5 minutes, which means all current time-based boosting behaviors will expire by that point. That's mostly Intel's Tau expiry right now, though. Here we see the 10900K at 200 watts instead of 130 watts previously, but this is only within a 52 second window, and the 5600X is basically unchanged. Everything is within a few watts of the previous numbers for the 5600X. So that's it for the 5600X then. We don't do like a massive conclusion. You can just watch the video if you'd like to get all the detail on where things fall. But uh, short of it, things to watch out for if you clicked here and you're now being told to actually just go watch the thing. The things to watch out for would be in some games, you'll see the stack shuffle a little bit where the 5600X moves around the 5900 and the 5950, depending on how much that game cares about the cores, maybe cache in some instances, but mostly cores, and uh, cares about the single core or limited core boosting frequencies. 5600X can hold, uh, in spiky instances, higher boosting frequencies than a 5900X, so you'll sometimes see the benefit given to the 5600X instead, just because the frequency is higher despite having fewer cores. The uh, 5600X compared to 59 and 5950, even when they're the 5950 and 5900X are ahead, the 5600X is right there. It's close enough that we're making the same statements we made about the 10600K, except now it's about an AMD part, which is basically that if you want the quote unquote best gaming CPU, Sure, you could get a 5900X, which is generally among the top performers, but not always. And if you don't do workstation tasks, then you're kind of wasting money. But realistically, the 5600X makes the most sense. And it's right up there at the top. There's not that much of a difference to that point. 5950 in most instances is technically in the lead, but a lot of the time you're talking one FPS. So 5600X looks like right now, other than Red Dead Redemption 2, it is uh, actually what we would call the best gaming CPU, which is what we called the 10600K previously. So the 10600K previously, we said it's the best gaming CPU asterisk, the asterisk being the best value and performance combined. The 10900K was technically in the lead, but the lead was so easily diminished with a simple OC on the 10.6, it just didn't make sense to actually buy a 10.9 for most gaming users. 5600X, same thing, except there's a double asterisk, and the second one means best gaming CPU except for in Red Dead Redemption 2, which is still Intel. But in our test suite, it's, it's leading. Uh, it's right next to the 10900K in a lot of instances. So AMD's done it, balls in your court, Intel at this point. The 5800X we'll look at next. That one is looking like it, well, you'll see when you check the review, but 5800X is oddly priced and positioned. Definitely the weirdest out of all of them. Uh, AMD is trying to go for an upsell, it seems like, with the 5800X. They're trying to push people to the 59. We'll talk about that in that review, though. Uh, check back for more. 5800X is next. Memory testing as well. And a whole bunch of other stuff with these CPUs, including overclocking streams. Subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up things like our brand new GN bar mat, bar runners, which uh, are on the store and shipping now. You can also back order our mouse mats, the wireframe desk size mouse mats. Those will be shipping out in the next couple of weeks, but we're taking back orders ahead of time. Patreon.com slash GamersNexus for behind the scenes, and we'll see you all next time.